Hi, you're listening to Marsha Pally and conversations I'm having with people about the criteria we should use to design and implement our economic and political policies. What should be our basic framework for determining public policy? These conversations are based on ideas from a book of mine, Commonwealth and Covenant, Economics, Politics, and Theologies of Relationality, because we're looking specifically at relationality as this framework for policy. Relationality includes both the individual person and the relations and contexts that he or she is in. Relationality is developed in many of our philosophical traditions and also in several theological traditions. Whether you think theologies are the word of the divine or an illuminating metaphor, in both cases they offer us much about how the world and people work and so about the policies that will lead to the greatest human flourishing. Please join us in this series of conversations. Commonwealth and Covenant was published by Erdman's Press in 2016. You can follow me at marshapally.com or search for me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm going to start with this quote. I stand before the image of your face, my God, uh, in a painting, an iconic image, the image of your face, my God, an image which I behold with the sensible eyes, and I attempt to view with inner eyes the truth which is pointed to by the painting. I want to unpack this a little. So if you have a painting of Jesus, right, that's a physical thing. That's canvas, it's paint, you can touch it, it's a physical item in the world. But Cusa noticed that it represents that which is not a physical object in the world. It represents whatever makes ever anything, it represents the ground for existence, it represents God. So the physical and the non-physical, the immaterial, are not separated from each other. The physical expresses the immaterial. And the physical painting can be seen by the physical eye, but the representation of the, what is not physical, of God, can be understood by what is not physical in us. Our thoughts are not physical. Our ideas are not physical. So he saw a fluidity between the physical world and the mental world. The symbols of a, of a painting are real and material, and yet they express what is not material, God. Our ideas about the painting are real, worldly things. And they, too, understand what is not physical, the source of everything, God. So for him, what is not physical in the world and what is physical in the world is simply not a problem. They're just in the world. And our physical can understand something of the non-physical, of the source of all being, just the way our thoughts can understand something of the non-physical, the source of all being. So the physical apparatus of a canvas of paint, the physical apparatus of the eye that is connected with this optic nerve to the brain and so on, that's all physical, he knew that, um, is part of the same worldly system as that which is not physical. And the physical can get at the non-physical and our non-physical thoughts see, can talk about painting and also apprehend the non-physical God that is represented. What we're trying to get at is a worldview that is not ours and it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to get at a worldview 
of Nicholas of Cusa after we have inherited 400 years of the modern Western tradition. It's not impossible, but it takes a little work. It takes a little work to see the fluidity and the back and forthness between the material and the material. It was simply not a problem for him. It didn't occur to him that that's a divide. So it's a little hard for us to get into uh, a, in this sense, quite different worldview. Right? It's like, it is like trying to get inside a very, very different culture. The out, outlying provinces of Malaysia, the very, very, very primary principles and assumptions will be quite different. And it's, it takes a long time to get, it's very, uh, to get inside it, to see from the other point of view. And that's what Nicholas of Cusa was arguing for with his protest against oculocentrism, Right? There's one way to see, and you see it from your point of view, to um, uh, a, an emphasis on hearing and the dialogic, the dialogue, dialogic from dialogue, experience of listening and talking with others. He um, gave a second example in his use of numbers. Uh, he noticed that numbers are um, First, he noticed that numbers are immaterial. They're concepts in our mind. Yeah? The, I mean, you can lay objects on the table, but the idea of one, two, three is a mental operation. We invented numbers. Human beings invented numbers. Other creatures may see objects, but we invented numbers. The idea that you somehow divide them into one, two, and three, and so on. They are abstract concepts. But he also noticed that for Nicholas of Cusa, numbers are also real things, and you can do real things with them. You can do real math that has real effect in the world, and when you're adding numbers and you're dividing and multiplying and so on, you're actually doing real things. Again, his example of the fluidity of abstraction and physicality of the material and the non-material, which again for him was simply not a divide. There's no problem for him with numbers being real and theoretical any more than there's the problem for him with my thoughts being non-material and this bottle being material. And my thoughts about the bottle and the bottle are both part of the world. For him, that's just not a division. We've already talked about the reason for existence, for there being something rather than nothing, it finds expression in all the particular things that there are. And of course, the reason for being everything is inexhaustible. Is everything that there is and everything that can possibly develop um, emerges from the ground for existence at all. And Nicholas of Cusa felt that the expression of the reason for everything, God, happens through, that um, happens in everything, and we understand it through all of our apprehension of the world, through all of our inner eyes, our senses, our reason, our science, our emotion. Yeah? So here we connect his idea about the multiplicity of knowing with the idea of God or the ground for everything. Yeah? It is precisely because the ground for everything self-expresses, self-donates in everything to be at all, that, and because each of us experiences the world slightly differently and also experiences different things. You experience different things from each other, from me. We all don't experience the whole world. Yeah? We, re, we benefit from the inclusion of everybody's experiences and everybody's modality, reason, belief, feeling, to understand more about what makes everything. If you want to understand what it is that grounds everything, what it is that is the reason for existence, we're never going to completely understand that. And as you know, science keeps revising its theories. We, and we make mistakes and we throw out old ideas. And that's exactly actually what Nicholas of Cusa predicted. 
We have to use all of us and all of our modalities to get at whatever makes existence. And maybe we get a little bit more and a little bit more. We never understand it entirely, but we benefit from all the modalities and all the perspectives of the different people. He wrote um, uh, something I think is very interested in expressing this. He wrote that God is the minimum that must be in everything in order to exist at all, right? The reason for existence must be in, metaphorically in, everything in order to exist at all. It must be folded into, he wrote, folded into, in medieval Latin, folded into everything to exist at all. But everything that exists outfolds something of the reason for existence, expresses something. So there's a folding in and a folding out. Yeah? It's not again a mathematical principle. The, um, <laughs> again, I don't know that in English, I'm trying to translate that. The minimal common denom denominator. <laughs> yeah, right. In that sense, God is the minimal common yeah. denominator. Well, he didn't exactly put it that way, but you're on to you're on something there. God is the minimum that must be in everything because the ground for existence has to be in anything that exists, otherwise it doesn't exist. And for Kusser, by the way, of course, that also includes your thoughts and your feelings. Yeah? These exist too, because he didn't have that mind world, physical, non-physical divide. God is in the minimum that is everything, and then he said, and God is also the maximum that everything is in, because God, the reason for existence, harbors, again, I'm using a, an anthropomorphism, but the reason for existence harbors all the possibilities of everything that it can exist. So there's an infolding of God, and the particulars fold out, particular aspects of all possibilities of everything that can exist. God is the minimum that is in everything and is also the maximum that everything is that is in. Whatever is the whatever is the ground for all existence is the absolute minimum that has to be in everything in order to exist. What, right? That's the first thing you have to have that. Otherwise you don't exist. So it's like the minimum condition for existence. Right? Okay, the cause of all existence is the minimum condition for existence. Oh. Um, but, and, um, so I'm going to say this in two ways. And everything that exists, like God is also the maximum that everything that exists is in, because everything that exists is a particular expression of the possibility of existence. So everything that exists also is in, speaking metaphorically, uh, God, the cause of all existence. You have to have a little bit of God to exist, but everything that exists is also in the maximum possibility, God, or the reason for all existence. If everything that exists expresses some subset, remember we talked about subset or some portion of the possibility of existence, you're a possibility of existence, so here is Moritz, so here is Yuya. You're all possibilities for existence. These are all possibilities of existence. There are a lot of possibilities, and there are some that are going to develop that we don't even know yet. And is one person somehow connected to all possibilities? In, in two ways. One, the ground of everything is in everything. So there's some very uh, profound existential commonality in order to exist. Existential commonality from the verb existence, from the noun existence, in order to exist. And second, because you become who you are through your layers of relations with uh, every person, uh, in your environment, even those at a distance who affect you, right, and whom you affect, and you're in your natural environment as well. So there are two ways of, mm -hmm. of connection. Mm -hmm. Okay? Does yeah. that help? Yeah. 
But the final point about Nicholas of Cusa is that he felt that the relation uh, of, right, so where the relation, the final point about Nicholas of Cusa is that the relation of love is the most uh, profound and important relation. Nice. Yeah. Sounds a bit naive, but it sounds <laughs> no. No, well, but it's not. Uh, um, but he had a pretty rigorous philosophical reason. He wasn't uh, being naive, and he wasn't being nice. I know, I know, right? I know that right. when and you say that like that, it's like uh, yes, well, but uh, I know that it's a more like dense concept yeah. of love than so. <laughs> so let me just say a couple of things about what he meant, right? That he wasn't being naively, and as the entire discussion of relationality is not naive, it's a discussion about what is our setup. Let's get very rigorous and very precise about what our actual setup is. And as we've already discussed, evolutionary biology and physics are now coming around to many of the ideas in relational philosophy and theology about our setup as primarily distinct, differentiated beings who become who they uniquely are in relation. That's the setup. So what Nicholas of Cusa said about love is also his effort to get at how we're set up. He, um, he felt that Love is the most important mode of understanding or relating to each other and the world because it partakes of divine seeing. God, Nicholas of Cusa wrote, envisioned the world, created what he envisioned, and loved what he saw, envisioned, and created. Humanity is created in God's sighted image. In other words, we are created in, a, in the image of a God who envisions, who sees, and from what he envisioned, creates, and loves his creation. That's the nature of God, insofar as humanity can understand it. Remember? That God, that reason for existence, that can envision, bring forth, and love what it has bring forth, is the minimum that is in us. Said another way, we are in the image of a God who envisions, brings forth, and loves what is brought forth. Therefore, to the extent that we do that, we come closest to the reason for all existence, God. As we envision, as we see, and as we love what we see, we are doing something, according to Nicholas of Cusa, that is, for humanity, close to God. One of the things that humanity can do within our human capacities that is closer rather than farther away from God. We express more profoundly and more deeply something of the ground for all existence when we envision and love what we see. That can be another person, that can be something in the uh, physical and natural or even industrial environment, right? Human art, human product is also included. Human tools are also included, yeah? So it's a profoundly relational view of what existence itself, the ground for existence God is doing, and what we can do that is, from a human perspective, that is, that is recalls that, echoes that, is close to that. Okay. So what I understand is that uh, when we talk about love, it's not like a like a long-term relation or something between humans. It's it's um, this this sh short moment. How you said when I see something and then I get a kind of um, feeling. So this is um, 
um, his idea of love. It's not like like um, 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 like a human relation over like ten years. This is not what he talks about when he talks about. Yeah. Love. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let me just say one thing. I want. I think um, for Nicholas of Cusa, love is a disposition towards the world. It's, it it's, could be a moment, it could be all your life, but it's a disposition about how you feel yourself to be in the world. What do you think you're doing when you're here? For as long as we're here. What are we doing? Love is a disposition, a, a, a tendency, attitudinal tendency towards your relationship to the world. Would you say we are loving? Say it again. Would you say we are loving? You mean we in this room? <laughs> 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 what are you, doing? you tell me. <laughs> but uh, the concept behind this, so that God loves what he sees, where the fundament of this? I mean, how can we say that? And what does it actually mean? How do we know that? I mean, because we say, okay, now we are, we can be related in this way, like by loving, so to say, um, but I cannot understand how we can say that, that God did that, or does, or should love us, or what he created if he created something. I mean, it's a good idea, but I mean, I wish it would, I mean, it, it's so, but I cannot find a um, a reasonable. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean by reasonable? I mean reasonable something that I can understand through rational, rational probably, yeah, rational. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. What was that? It's a postulate. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's a, a postulate. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a premise. Uh, yeah. It's a premise or axiom of. Um, the relational theology or relational philosophy and it's what we talked about in some previous conversations uh, that there is some ground that is the reason for existence and that there are some things we can say about it because we are of it. Now I'm going to just repeat from, and it's a good thing to repeat and keep these primary concepts sort of um, alive on the table. That there is some, some people call it God, some people call it many other things, but there is some, there is some reason that things exist. Once things exist, you can describe what they are. This is water, this is this chemical, this is that chemical, this is, this is how water, hydrogen, and oxygen combine. Yeah, yeah, okay. But there's some reason that things exist at all, and that the particular things that exist do exist. Why is there hydrogen? Why should there be hydrogen at all? Why should there be heat at all? Anywhere, ever. Right? Why should there, why should there be extension, without which we don't have physical objects. Yeah? Why, why should there be such a thing at all? And since there is, we notice, and this is, uh, this is the relational understanding, we notice that whatever the reason for that is, is quite different from what we individuals are, but, as Nicholas Kusa say, there has to be something of whatever that is in us in order for us to exist. And from this we can understand that a condition of existence is difference, we are different from the reason for existence, and but relation or intimacy. Remember, Thomas Aquinas called it that God is intimate in all of us. Right. So the, it is true that it is a postulate or an axiom of relational philosophies and theologies that we can know something of the system we're in because we're of it. Even if we only know it imperfectly, which we definitely do, even if we make mistakes, which we do every day, um, we can know something of it and hopefully with continued a 
accumulation of our multiple perspectives and multiple study and multiple thought and multiple discussion. We get to know a little bit more, we correct our mistakes, and slowly, 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 we learn something of the system we're in because we're in it. This is the profound critic, uh, critique of um, the Kantian philosophy, as you mentioned earlier. So it, it, if, if you're a diagnable Kantian, this is going to be hard for you. I'm not saying you are, but um, it, it would be, because it is going against the um, primary separation for a primary inclusion, mm -hmm. that there's something about the structure of existence itself that we can understand because we exist. I can. You can prove this one, you can prove the other one. That's, that's correct. And that's why I actually, I actually like this uh, this vision that some, somehow we need everybody's contribution. So if I were Kantian, I would also be happy to hear that, I mean, from another perspective. And that's um, nothing to say about that. I'm actually happy to read that. But um, this would, would, would love somehow, I think, that postulate that um, we are kind of, the world is a kind of art of love, it's, a, it's too much. I mean, I, I would say the only, the only reason I could find for that is that since we are saying that we participate and we, we have been created in a God's image, so maybe we could deduce, or maybe anyway, said, okay, since we are related in this way, like by loving or uh, whoever you want to describe that, um, we can assume that God, God does the same, somehow. But well, not the opposite yeah. one, because it... Yeah, there is, well, you, can't, you have to start from there, you're right. Because since we don't start from the perspective of God, we start from our perspective. So there, you're, in that sense you're right, that we, how can I say, work backwards yeah. from our experience of the world to say, well, maybe the structure of existence has something to do with our experience of the world because we exist, yeah? So that's, that is a, that's a, a premise of relational philosophy and theology. Again, we have some access to the world and through many modalities, senses, emotions, intuition, reason, science, and so on. So we can use, our, carefully, cautiously, use our experience of the world from there to work to uh, our experience of existence back to thinking some things about the ground for all existence, and why can we do that? Because we exist, so there must be something of our experience of existence that is connected to existence, yeah? In a very uh, profound, uh, basic, existential way, right? Um, also, I would suggest that we explore the world, just a word, love, for a little bit. But it does uh, have something to do with Thomas Aquinas' use of um, God is intimate in all of us. And I think the use of the word intimate is very important uh, here, that it is an intimate relation. And it involves um, reciprocal effect. I affect you, you affect me. It's a reciprocal, and a reciprocal care because of that reciprocal impact. These are some of the components of love, rather than dating. Yeah, you I think the question is so typical for, uh, for us needing, uh, or this, uh, for, for the world, the scientific world we're living in, how just love just doesn't fit into it, and how confusing, even though it, it completely makes sense, but how confusing it is to bring it into this sort of scientific theological context and saying it's so bold to say that the most, the, the key, what would you say, love is the most important mode of understanding. When I talk to, this, to the atheists, I have some at home, I say that it's all a coincidence, and then they tell me, what about artificial intelligence? Would you, would you hand over the world to artificial intelligence, and I ask them, 
but are they able to love? And the, the, and the response is always, always this love. Always, why always this love? What is it? But this is really, in, in the end, this is what makes us a human. I think that's one problem, but I also think that we have an insufficient discussion of what the word love means. To because, uh, as we uh, intimated just a moment ago, that we, uh, we need to think how love is meant in the language of Nicholas of Cusa or any other philosophical or theological treatise, right? And that um, I want to now I'll make a suggestion from Esther Meek, who wrote a wonderful book about knowing. And she suggests that to come to know anything is an act of love in the kind of attention that you have to pay to something in order to know it. Now that's very different from the sense of love as it is used in many aspects of popular culture. So we, again, have to pay attention to how we're using that word. Right? Um, there, there's a kind of devotion and attention to something in order to know it at all. This was not a problem for, for Nicholas of Cuso when he used the word love, but it may be a problem for us both because of the hegemony of science, right? If some, I want to be able to prove things. What, what's love? How can you prove that? How can you run a scientific experiment to prove love? So that, therefore, it's a useless concept. Right? So we have the problem of the hegemony of the hard sciences, and we have the problem of the cheapening of the word, of the word love. And we need, when we encounter love in our philosophical and theological discussions, we have to make sure we're not going down the rabbit hole of science or down the rabbit hole of pop culture and remember how we're using the word um, love. I, wa I want to draw our attention again um, to the uh, problem of the hegemony of the hard sciences that you pointed out to. Um, we remember the joke by David Bentley Hart, physics describes everything. Um, everything that exists is described by physics, therefore what physics doesn't describe doesn't exist because physics describes everything. Yeah? Uh, and then you get yourself in a perfect circular tautological um, description of existence which blocks out a great many things that um, in fact happen to people which has, is not describable by physics. Mm -hmm. yeah.